this this morning, so praise the Lord. And God bless all of you again for being here, and uh, praise the Lord. It's looking like we might get out early today. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I knew that was coming because the last couple of weeks we've been... It's take longer to get home. Yeah, we, yeah exactly. Uh, we've been running over about all the time you half hour. Thank you, praise the Lord. My man back there, praise God. Thank you, Brother Mike. Praise God. You know, uh, speaking of movies, <laughs> transition there. That movie uh, Ivanhoe has been banned. Did you know that? Uh, too much sex and violence. <laughs> sex. Ivanhoe. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Tough crowd this morning. How are you? You know, when I was younger, I wanted to work in a factory that uh, made frozen orange juice. I didn't get the job because I couldn't concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I lost the job due to illness. My boss got sick of me. <laughs> but I don't, I never give up, you know, so I tried uh, the monogram business and I achieved initial success there, but <laughs> actually I had to move on. Praise the Lord. God's always in a good mood. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've, I, I've done a lot to try to get him out of that mood, but it doesn't seem to change him at all. Praise the Lord. He stays in a good mood. Hallelujah. God's good, isn't he? Amen. All the time. All right. So let's... Uh, Let's begin. I want to start uh, with Psalms 139 and verse 16. And I hope you'll all pay attention because, I, like I told Sally, sometimes, you know, I'm thinking things. And uh, because it makes sense to me, it doesn't necessarily make sense to anybody else. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? When you get on, a th you kind of start thinking about certain things and everything seems to make sense to you. And then you say it to somebody else and they have that blank look on their face and you go... Oh, well, maybe I didn't understand that quite like I thought I did, praise the Lord. So I hope you'll pay attention and, and maybe the Lord will speak to us, praise God. So Psalms 139 verse 16 says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Praise the Lord. Now remember, Tammy was talking about how that God has a way of... Uh, when he speaks to us or when he's trying to get our attention, he, he uses almost everything. And a lot of times we don't get it because it's just normal talk for God. But it's not necessarily normal listening for us. Yes. But the more you look, the more you realize he's saying it over and over in all kinds of different ways. He's trying to say the same things to us. Amen. So here he talks about Jesus is the head. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So you can look at this in multiple ways. First of all, it's prophetic speaking of Jesus. But it's also speaking of the body of Christ. Amen? His members weren't yet there. But he was in the mind of God. We were already in him before the foundation of the world, right? So Jesus is the head. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning, amen, the firstborn, the preeminent one. Right? And the more you look at the Word of God, the more you begin to see, not only do you see the head, Jesus Christ, but we also see the members of His body. We're hidden in here too. Praise the Lord. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14. So now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we've got to look at the word of God, including Jesus. Jesus is the Word 
made flesh, amen, in light of spiritual revelation. Praise the Lord. If you just read the flat, what's on the page, you'll get information and you'll get some revelation. But the real revelation is in the depth of the scripture. I've said it a lot of times. It's more like a matrix. And the more you look into it, the deeper it goes and the more you begin to understand and realize. And that's because you begin to think more in terms of the spirit rather than the natural. And all of a sudden things seem obvious to you that didn't seem obvious before, even though you may have read it multiple times, right? So this isn't just, we're not just talking about in a historical sense here either, but immediate today, right now, in the moment, it's fresh, it's unfolding, it's a revelation of Jesus. It never gets old, there's always new, there's always more, amen, and it's only when we stop looking for more that we quit finding more that we get bored. All right, Genesis, look at this, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, praise the Lord, Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. And in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the, dark, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So that word, in the beginning, so like the third letter, or third word, beginning, in the beginning, that word is, uh, in Strong's Concordance, it's number 7225, which is in the Hebrew, is reshith. And that word means, literally translated, beginning means first fruit. So you could read it literally, in the first fruit, God created heaven and the earth. Creation created in Christ. He is the first fruits. We just read it a moment ago. He is the preeminent, the firstborn. Amen. The head of many members. Well, think of it this way. In the beginning, your beginning. Now, he tells us it's the beginning of what we understand as the universe today. But in your beginning... He called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. How? By the first fruit. Out of that first fruit we came. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. In the beginning, in the first fruit, we all existed. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Are you tracking with me here? Praise the Lord. So, Colossians 1 and verse 16. So there's something about Jesus everywhere you look in the Scripture, and therefore there's something about us because we were in Christ. So for by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. John 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. John 1, 1 through 3. So, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and the, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Praise the Lord. This is more than history. It's more than just a, uh, a, a historical, you know, description of the planet. It's also our individual histories. Yes. Praise the Lord. Each and every one of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 through 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 23. Praise the Lord. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, as we read in the beginning, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Not just talking about the second coming, we're talking about when Christ shows up, we show up because we are in him. And then we are manifest because we get born again out of that first fruit. Amen. We come out of darkness into his marvelous light for all as in Adam. So, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 11. And then I'll give you a little break back there, Sheila. She's looking for the uh, carpal tunnel brace right now. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him 
before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Praise the Lord. So, I want to talk to you about something, Raz. Anybody here ever, ever heard of Raz? Praise the Lord. Not Raz, R-A-Z-Z, -Z, but R-A-S. It's Reticular Activating System. Praise the Lord. You're ready for this, are you? Praise the Lord. Get your notes out. And what this reticular activating system is, it's deep down inside of our brains. Praise the Lord. Scary stuff. Amen. All day, every day, everyone, everywhere is being bombarded with millions and millions of stimuli. Sure. Amen. Sights, sounds, smells, sensations. Amen. And if our minds tried to process and respond to all the stimuli all the time, our brains would shut down because they'd be overwhelmed sure. with all of the stimuli. Yeah. Overactivity would cause us just to shut down. But our brains don't even try to process and respond to all of it. And that's because the RAS, this reticular activating system, serves as a filter that determines what stimuli will be processed and what won't. Okay. Praise the Lord. So there's one specific, or significant at least, determining factor that the RAS uses to determine which stimuli are allowed to pass into the brain. And that is whether or not the stimuli are somehow relevant to you. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. If they are, then the stimuli get in. If not, then they don't. So this could just be me and my imagination going a little wild, but because sometimes I get overwhelmed with stimuli. You ever get sometimes where you just thoughts just overwhelm you, you know? So here's the deal. I wonder if the reason can just sit down and casually read Jesus' words and not be more impacted is because only some of the words are actually being processed by our minds. Are you with me? The RAS, it, it's not picking up everything, right? The other words and their implications are filtered out because they don't seem relevant to the Jesus that we believe in or the Jesus that we worship. In other words, we only get information that we can validate in our own thinking. So there's some stuff that we may be rejecting simply because it doesn't fit exactly. the preconceived ideas that we have of Jesus. It's true of religion. It's true of everything. That's why a lot of people reject religion because they have these ideas of what it is based on something somebody else told them and not really based on the relationship that God wants to have with them. It's become about rules and following regulations and all this stuff. So whenever that stimuli comes, we shut. We don't even receive it. We don't process it because it's not relevant to us in the way that we think. So when we read Jesus' words, some of which, you know, ought to, ought to cause us to just freak out. Ought to cause us just to jump up and scream and praise the Lord and hallelujah. What the heck? How can this be? But we can read them curled up on the couch, amen, with a cup of coffee or something, amen, and humming a song. Just kind of like it's a fairy tale and, well, Jesus did this. and Without being impacted at all, right? Well, there's another tendency that when we study Jesus' words, we decide that Jesus didn't mean exactly what he said. Right? I mean, that's why we've got 50,000 different denominations, because we've decided what we think he meant. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so we take what we thought he meant and run off this way and somebody else goes the other way. And it may be why all the Methodist churches are closed today. I'm just kidding. I know that went out on the internet. I'm just teasing. It's wise. It was wisdom. It was discretion to do that. Praise the Lord. I have nothing against Methodists. My grandparents were Methodists. Praise the Lord. Bless their hearts. Praise God. So, we want Jesus' words, his message, his instructions, his explanations to fit within the framework of the Savior that we have envisioned him to be. Right? But if you think about it, this narrows this thing way down to where we're not getting a whole lot of revelation. We're just getting more information that satisfies the preconceived idea that we already have. So we don't want to deal with the, uh, the incongruity, you know, of our perception of Jesus coming up against the reality of who he is. Praise the Lord. We have to be willing to acknowledge that our concepts of him may not always be accurate. Well, we know this is true because whenever we first got saved and where you are today, how many of these have changed? I mean, how much of that has, has changed? Now, obviously, there's some foundational truths that are there, but a lot of things have changed. I mean, I know my way of thinking about the Lord and the truth and the Word are, are far different than they were when I first got saved, when I was first born again. Praise the Lord. So we have to be willing to acknowledge that our concepts are not always accurate. Praise the Lord. And then be willing to search for the truth and be led by it, or Him, amen, rather than our religion or some counterfeit. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's really what makes it exciting. Yes. See, we're, we get so paranoid that we're going to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing and somehow blaspheme that we don't say much of anything except what's rote. You know, I mean, what is just the routine kind of stuff that we just repeat all the time because we know it's foundational truths, right? Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21. Luke 4, 17 through 21. And this is Jesus. And he goes to the scroll of Isaiah. Obviously, they didn't have the New, New Testament then. So Luke wasn't there. Luke is just writing down what Jesus did. And what he did was he went to Isaiah chapter 61 in the scrolls, what we call Isaiah 61. There wasn't an Isaiah 61. There was, but it just wasn't called 61. It was just Isaiah. It was just the scroll. So he goes to the place in the scroll of Isaiah. He's in the temple, right? Or in the uh, synagogue. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he found himself in the Word of God. And he says, The Lord is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Look at what he's doing here, what he's saying. He's told me to come preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, or the year that God is accepting, not judging, not punishing, but accepting. It's grace. Amen. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So he said, This prophecy is fulfilled right now, just because I'm here. Right? So the scripture... And, and Jesus' reading of it confirms that God is not satisfied with the world remaining the way it is. Right. Or he wouldn't send him to proclaim right. the fact that God loves us. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that he came to heal us, to deliver us, to set us free, to prosper us, and to bless us. That's God's purpose. Regardless of what religion says or, or denominations or people, this is what God says. This is His agenda. And He says, I, I'm not going to leave the world in the mess that it's in. Right. I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm sending you somebody, who by the way we are in, to change the way the world is. Yes. To reveal the love of God. To reveal yes. the mercy, the goodness, and the grace of God. Amen. See, God is in the deliverance business. He He's interested in delivering. He's interested in, in liberating, praise the Lord, 
empowering and transforming all of us, everybody. Praise the Lord. Jesus didn't just declare this message. He demonstrated it. Everywhere he went, he did those things. Amen. I only do what I hear my father say. Well, this is what the father said. This is what I'm doing, right? That's his approach to all of humanity. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Showing the, the countercultural character of God's kingdom. It's countercultural to what our normal culture is. It's against it. It's almost a paradox or a, 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 a contradiction. Amen. So the kingdom of God is to be like heaven on earth. No poverty, no sickness, no disease, no brokenness, no bondages. Amen. And so Jesus comes himself to be the way, the truth, and the right life. Or the life that God intended us to live. Not a religious life, not a life of, you know, being a robot and, and everybody's acting perfectly the same and nobody's ever screwing up and nobody's ever... But living a life of freedom. Praise the Lord. From your own fears, from your own expectations, from your own failures, from your own doubts, from the expectations of others. Yes. Praise the Lord. After Jesus read from Isaiah, everybody, everybody was excited with him. They thought, man, what's a cool guy? This is really a good guy. Amen. He come to set us free. Praise the Lord. This is good stuff, right? Luke 4.22. They said, all and all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words or the words of grace, forgiveness, mercy, goodness that God has for him, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They were struck with the fact that somebody so like them was bringing a message that was so different to them. Yes. That was so profound, right? Yes. But they quickly turned on him. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. Amen. When he pointed out his message was contrary to the way they had believed and lived. If you, I'm not going to read them, but you can read uh, the, the next two or three verses when it says, he says, you know what, weren't there a lot of blind people in Israel? Well, then how come God had to go all the way to uh, Syria to find a blind man to heal? W weren't there lepers in Israel? But he had to go to a foreign country to find somebody that would believe that he would heal him. Right? And then he says, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the woman whose ch children were, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not exactly sure what they were, but there's like three different things that he's talking about to him that they were all familiar with from their history, from the history of the, uh, uh, the Jewish people. And so uh, what about, weren't there uh, women with children that were enslaved in Israel? That he had to go to another country to set that woman free and her children free mm -hmm. because nobody in Israel believed that God would do it or God wanted to do it or that God was willing to do it. And that ticked them off. They liked what he was saying when it was all God loves you, God's good, God, you're great, he's setting you free. And then he says, but the, there's a problem here because even though God wants to do all this for you, how come it didn't happen here? Yeah. How come it happened in some foreign country why didn't you believe? Why didn't you trust that God wanted this for you? Are you following me? Praise the Lord. Luke 4, verse 28 and 29. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now, a minute ago, they thought he was great. This guy's cool. He's just like us. But, man, listen to what he's saying. And then he talks to him about, well, yeah, but none of y'all don't have any faith. You know, I mean, you don't believe God wants to do these things for you. And then they're aggravated. Now they're mad. They heard these things. They were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him up to the brow of the hill where their, where their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've been to a couple of parties like that where I was really popular, you know, and then I don't know what happened, but next thing I know... I'm on the brow of the hill, you know, praise the Lord. But this, this is what happened. See, they, they, he made them mad because he didn't, he didn't appear the way they thought he was supposed to be. He didn't just say, y'all are great, you know, you believe everything, you're just what? No, he said, yeah, you don't have any faith here. That's the problem. 
God wants to set you free, but you don't have any faith. And so they, they want to kill him. They want to throw him off the cliff. Praise the Lord. That's the world that he came into. It is. Now, I, watch the, I try not to watch it very much, but I catch the news every once in a while. All it does is irritate me, and so I try not to put much attention on it. But in the world today, terrorism, racial issues, immigration debates, uh, abortion, uh -huh. this is, that's just a couple of things uh -huh. that you'll see on the news all the time, continuously. Because it's what's happening. I mean, it is the truth. It is what's going on, right? The hardship that Jesus entered into is worth looking at, in my opinion. Because this is the mess we're in. He was in a mess, too. It wasn't just a wonderful world. It was a messed up world back then, too. And that's what he was born into. That's what he had to deal with. Amen? Even his upbringing. Just think about the way he was raised, everybody questioned whether his father was even legitimately his father, right? Mm -hmm. They said the town that he grew up in, it's a ghetto, it's a slum, it's a, it's a, no, nobody but failures come out of that. Can any good thing, right? Mm -hmm. So even his upbringing would cause people to question his claims to be a king and to have a kingdom. Right. Praise the Lord. Does that sound familiar? We are kings and priests. We have a kingdom. We are part of a kingdom and we have dominion. But it don't look that way to a lot of people. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't look that way to us. You see what I'm saying? Now we're talking about what he said and what we believe. Right. How we receive what he said. We can read it and just go, oh, yeah, but I still got this. You know, the doctor says it's cancer. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, by his stripes I'm healed. And, uh, you know, he... Whatever I set my hand to prospers, but, you know, they've got the bills, and they're not paid. and Right? I mean, all the, that's, that's what we do. Praise the Lord. There was questions about the value of his hometown. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Amen. His earthly father not only was his uh, genealogy question, whether he's actually his father... Maybe she had an affair because we know that she was pregnant when they got married. You know the whole story, right? And uh, the fact that his dad, if he really was his dad, was a carpenter. He was a blue-collar worker. He was just an average schmuck. You know, he was just a guy trying to get through life, just trying to make a living, trying to support himself, trying to take care of his family. Yeah. His people, his ethnicity, his group, his his... Right? His racial right. group were slaves. They were enslaved by the Roman government, yeah. by an oppressive uh, Roman Empire. So much so that he became a refugee as a child, as a baby, amen, because the government was killing all the babies that looked like him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not crossing T's and dotting I's, I'm just saying, this is not a lot different than the world we've grown up in and the world that we even face today. Praise the Lord. John 17, verse 14 through 18. And yet, Jesus still believed that the kingdom could come. Yes. No matter how screwed up everything was, no matter how much of the news he was hearing, day in and day out, that he was witnessing in his own life, and yet he's saying, there's a, great, there's a truth that's greater than these facts that we're looking at. And that's where he lived. That's what he spoke. That's what he lived out of. That's what he acted out. Amen? John 17, verse 14 through 18. So, praise the Lord. Stay with me now. I'm, I haven't forgot where I was. It's like the preacher that my pastor used to say, he took his, he took his text, left it, and never came back. <laughs> I've given them my word, and the word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray not thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou, that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Praise the Lord. I'm guessing if, we're, if he's sending us the same way he was sent, then it would probably be a good idea if we did what he did. Yeah. If we believed what he believed. Right. Otherwise, we are at the mercy of a world who hates us exactly. and doesn't want anything to do with us. Amen? 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, uh, living into this identity is what Jesus did. He said, that's me, I'm going to live this identity. He lived into the identity that had been declared about him and over him. And it was strange to the people that were around him. Because the identity that he was living into didn't fit the identity that they saw in the natural. Yes. They saw he's a poverty-stricken kid in a ugly little part of town and... Uh, not even sure if it's legitimate. And, and yet he's saying that he's a king and a priest. That he has a kingdom. So you can see why people would have thought, Get this. he's not quite right, you know. Even his own family came out to get him. Once thought he'd lost his mind because of the things that he was saying. And living into this identity is what Jesus is asking us and showing us how to do. Now, if you don't want people talking about you, you probably shouldn't do this. Yeah. <laughs> because the more you do this, the more you separate yourself from the natural realm. Doesn't mean we don't like him. Doesn't mean we don't love him. Doesn't mean we don't. I mean, he went about healing everybody. Yeah, he, he went about trying to give this to everyone, not just a particular religious group, right? In this world that we live in, as broken as it is, there is a tremendous need yes. for radical reconcilers. And that's what Jesus was. He came to reconcile the world to God. In other words, he came to make things right between people and God. Uh -huh. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation yes. to do what? To find fault with everybody? To point out all of their screw-ups and why they're so dysfunctional? No. To tell them, God wants to set you free. Yeah. God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to do for you what he's done for me and more. You may be way ahead of me in faith. You may be able to believe for things that I haven't been able to believe yet. And you say, well, I don't even, I'm not even sure about God. All it takes is to believe. Yeah. That's the first step. Amen? Christ is the great reconciler. Through his death, burial, and reconciliation, or, or uh, rest, uh, restoration, he has made possible our acceptance in God. His death, burial, and resurrection has made me acceptable to God. More than acceptable, he has made me righteous in the eyes of God. Yes. And I didn't do anything. And I still... I'm still as unrighteous in the natural as I ever was. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying you're not righteous because of the stuff you do. Amen. You're not a sinner because of the things that you do. You're a sinner simply because you don't believe in Christ. Yeah. If you believe in Christ, you're no longer a sinner. You may still sin, sure. but you're not a sinner. Right? God has declared you righteous. He has redeemed you and declared you to be the righteousness of God in Christ. That's hard to get. That's hard for our, that stimuli that comes to our brain that doesn't fit. Because we're taught our entire life, you get your act together and you get out there and work hard and, and you'll be successful. And then we find out that no, it's, it's the what I don't do and haven't done that has made me acceptable in the eyes of God. 
He has declared me to be the same thing He declared Jesus to be. He was the firstborn. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to tell people it's all good between you and God. I have the same thing. We have the same spirit. We have the same anointing. We have the same responsibility, if you will. Amen? So, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 19 and 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. And, and we've spent, you know, obviously a couple thousand years here trying to develop the perfect religion only to find out that isn't why he came. I mean, he wasn't really interested in religion uh, any more than most of us are, praise the Lord. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself or making things right, not imputing their trespasses unto them, not holding them responsible or holding them accountable for their failures. Listen, this is the good news. The good news is all of my screw-ups have been taken care of by Jesus. That's how much he loves me. Nothing between me and God changed based on what I have done. And I may, I may have done some good things over the last 35 years. But I've done some bad stuff too. I've been bad. I think I need a spanking. Later. Praise the Lord. You're not going to hear that in every church service. Not saying it's right. Just say it. It's good. It's good between us. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses or their failures or their sins and so forth unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of recon reconciliation. So he reconciled us so that we can do the same. Why? Because what did he say? I'm going to my father. And father, don't take him out of the world. Just protect him from the evil that's in the world because they're here for the same reason that I was here. Isn't that, we, we read that, right? Amen. So our purpose is identical. He's the first fruit. We are all yes. that comes afterwards. And then, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though through God, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead or in the place of Christ, be reconciled to God. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Be reconciled. That's what I'm asking. Just Get over you and be reconciled to God. Yes. Just take yes. the gift. Take the free thing. Yes. Praise the Lord. So in, a, in, in the world that we live in, in a world that Jesus lived in for that matter, broken systems, amen, and, and broken institutions. And as believers, we have an opportunity to represent the eternal plan of God, mm -hmm. the eternal purpose of God, yes. and the reality of of the nature of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. We are citizens of a government born out of our relationship with God and our identity in Christ. And what I see in the news and what I hear from the different parties is people trying to produce that kingdom in the natural. And it cannot happen. It won't happen. You can legalize everything, but it won't change people's hearts. That's true. God has basically done exactly that. Where there is no law, there's no breaking of the law. That's right. And the law has been fulfilled in Christ. So there is no law. Yes. Now, the only law that we have is to love God and to love each other. Yes. That's all we got to do. And we'll have problems doing it, praise the Lord. Amen. Because we don't love ourselves because we don't accept the first reality. True. It's hard to pass on the rest of it. If I don't believe, if, I don't, if I'm not confident in God's acceptance and in God's love, then I'm going to be looking for problems in everybody else to justify my problems. Yeah. It makes me feel better if I find somebody that's worse than me. Right. right? The only problem is if I look very hard, I'll find too many that are better than me. And that makes me feel bad. That makes me feel guilty. Uh -huh. So i got to find somebody who's a really big mess that makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. See, I'm not that bad. Praise the Lord. But what we don't understand is we are either righteous or unrighteous. That's right. We're either saved or we're not saved. That's, it. That's the bottom line. That's all there is to it. Praise the Lord. Yep. Hallelujah. 
our citizenship is not of this world. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. Yes. It's in the kingdom of God. And we are ambassadors or representatives of that kingdom. We're in this world, but we're not of this world because we have been born again, born from above. Praise the Lord. In the kingdom of God, there is no disease. There's no poverty. There's no racism. There's no sexism. There's no oppression. There's no bondage. There's no manipulation. Amen. There's peace. There's reconciliation. There's acceptance. There's love. There's mercy. There's grace. It's not something we're waiting for, guys. It's not something we are anticipating will come one day. We are in it. We are living in it and should be living out of it. Exactly. That's exactly what Jesus did. He heard what his father said and he just did it. He just believed it and lived his life based on it. Amen. Praise the Lord. When I was a kid, and actually I can still remember some of it, except for the 60s. <laughs> I mean, if you really lived in the 60s, you can't remember it. But nevertheless, I spent a lot of time dreaming about being an adult. Because yeah. I saw adulthood as freedom. Yeah. I don't have to eat Brussels sprouts. Right? I don't have to go to bed. If I want to watch Graves and Manor, I can watch the horror shows, you know, I can stay up late. And... So I saw adulthood as, as an adventure. Freedom, just whatever, you know. I decide what I want to do and when I want to do it. And nobody's going to tell me no. But you know what I learned? In Christ, we have become the beloved children of God. Yeah. So we, based on the word of God, we're supposed to approach God as a child. Uh -huh. Now, at my age, that's sometimes difficult to think in those terms. But that's what he says. That's what he tells us. Uh -huh. See, what I miss about being a kid more than anything else, I think, is the innocence of it. Because you don't know half of the stuff that you're doing is actually even wrong until uh -huh. you get caught. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about my grandkids, the little ones. The older ones, you know, they're adults now. It's a whole, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a horizontal relationship. But, you know, the, the little ones, they're innocent. Yeah. They can be just so. nasty as yeah. the hell, you know. <laughs> but they're innocent. They don't know. They haven't learned all that stuff yet. And that's part of the fun of being around them. Plus the fact that they think I'm the greatest. Yeah. Right? They haven't outgrown our relationship right. to where it has become this kind of a relationship. It's still like this. Yeah. Popo, you buy, buy me some crayons and a coloring book and you are God. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiling me, you know? Some bubble gum, a candy, you know, a sucker. You, they, they just, the look in their eyes, it's, it's like, I mean, it's great. Yeah. It's egotistical, I understand, but I mean, it's, it's, it feels good. Yeah. I don't I, I can be a complete, it's like having a really good dog. Yeah. They never find fault with you. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Maybe not the perfect analogy, but they are like pets. And they look to you for everything. Sure. They trust everything you say. Yes. I draw pictures. I was never a very good artist. I wanted to be, but I just was never good with it, you know? I mean, I took all the appreciation courses and stuff because I liked it. But I couldn't actually do the stuff, you know? Now, I've got a brother that's a great artist. In fact, he dropped off a, a picture of the crucifixion for me here. My older brother he used to be perfect. And I've got Tony was always really a really good artist. Got a lot of awards. Uh, Madison, Sydney, uh, other grandkids, just, they just grab a thing and they draw it and you go, oh my God, you know, it looks like a photograph. It's just unbelievable. But I'm saying, for me, I can draw the, the dragon that looks not like a dragon, 
But to them, it looks like a dragon because their dragons are all boxes yeah. or straight lines. So mine look fantastic. I know they'll outgrow them. So eventually, they'll look back and go, God, he was a horrible artist. I thought he was so good, you know. But I'm just saying, we haven't outgrown that relationship. It's still, Popo can do anything, you know. He's great. He's all powerful, you know. God, he's so strong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. they're five. Yeah. I guess the only anxiety is that I know, having had multiple grandchildren, the day will come when I will. They will outgrow the relationship the, what, the way it is today. Right. Now, it establishes things for the future, and I'm grateful for that. But the way it is today isn't going to the way it's going to be forever. Right. The day is going to come when they're going to see that Popo has feet of clay. You know, he's, he's human. He's got flaws. He's got his issues as well, right? Well, look at Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. 18, excuse me, uh, Sheila. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. See, the thing about grandkids is, even though it's all about them, it's all about you. <laughs> I make it look like it's all about them. But the truth is, I'm getting way more yeah. out of it than they are. Yeah. I mean, for a few bucks, bubble gum. Yeah. Right? So, kind of you roll off the... I mean, I, I go to the dollar store just to shop for grandkids. Yeah. That's the only reason I go there. There you go. Because they got all this crap that they love. <laughs> and you know what? They're going to ruin it anyway right. within a 24-hour period. So don't, you don't want to spend a lot of money on it because they don't know the difference anyhow. That's right. They don't know if you spent $50 or $5. I mean, you, if you give them the choice between five ones and a 20, they'll take the five ones every time. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Anyway, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest, in the kingdom of heaven. How many times have we read that? Do we think he was just BSing? He didn't have nothing else to do but to just, you know, kind of give the disciples a hard time? He's telling us something. Yeah. He's trying to get something to us. But we read it with the... Little children. Really? At 70? Yeah. You know, just that's a figure of speech. It's something other than reality. But according to Jesus, becoming a child is our entrance into the kingdom. And it's also the impetus for the work of heaven. In other words, it's the thing that makes the work of heaven show up in our lives here and now. Yes. Are you with me? How do you get... What's the kingdom? The kingdom is in you. Yeah. And in you are... Healing, prosperity, yes. deliverance, right? And there is no sickness, disease, and all that stuff in the kingdom. Exactly. Because the kingdom comes from heaven. And we are to rule in it. But the only way you can do it is as a child, according to Jesus, yes. who happens to be the king of the kingdom, yes. who would probably understand the rules of the kingdom, sure. the way things work in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. When Jesus was saying these words, children were given very little value, if any, at all. They had no power. They had no control. They, they, they didn't have anything other than the fact that they were a kid. They didn't have poverty programs. They didn't have orphanages. That was it. You're a kid. Amen? Amen? Today, we live in a time when children have much more value, or they're valued more, I should say it that way maybe, 
But they have no real voice. They don't have any real influence. They don't have any real power. Any more than they had back then. They're still dependent, right? They're vulnerable. They need to be taken care of. They need to be protected. Jesus is saying this is how we're supposed to be. Their vocabulary is limited. Their understanding is limited. They can only handle so much. Their understanding is limited. So we give them all kinds of what? Analogies, metaphors, little stories, fables, whatever you want to call it, to teach them. The parables that are in the Bible are written for children. Us, adult children. Praise the Lord. Think, I'm just, here's what goes through my mind. How could the kingdom of God come on the earth as it is in heaven through an army that thinks like a bunch of kids? Right? Because we're trying to rationalize this and we're, try, we're getting the stimuli, but it's not fitting the program. How could any follower of Jesus lead an effective revolution by acting like a kid? See, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. And so Jesus' words about children would sound, seem like a paradox or we're misunderstanding something. Uh -huh. Or he didn't really mean it. Right. Just filling up pages because they had to have so many of them. But Christ establishes our identity and our purpose as being childlike. Now, that's, this is what he said. I'm not making it up. I just re, I'm just reading what he actually said. We come before God. How? Vulnerable. Not fully in control of everything. We want to be in control of everything just like a kid does. The kids want to do stuff that they're not ready to do. Like, can we play with the butcher knives? Probably not. How about the loaded gun? No. Keys to the car? Not so much, you know. We want to be in charge. Yeah, we do. And God's saying, look, it doesn't work that way. You've got to be as a little kid. You've got to be like you were as a child. Uh -huh. When you were in awe of everything. Yeah. In a lot of ways, our, our tr pursuit of, of, of freedom... It's futile. The harder I try, the freer to be, the more in bondage I become. Yeah. We have to keep seeing ourselves as God's beloved children. Yes. And that's messy. Yes. Because kids are messy. Oh, sure. They try to do stuff they can't do, and they make a mess. Yes. And then who gets to clean it up? Yeah. And even when I get them the stuff, when it's time to leave, so long, Popo, see you next trip. And all the crap is left for me to pick up and put away and clean up. And Why? Because they're messy. They're kids. They, they, they don't understand the whole thing. Right. And you know what? I just pick it up, <coughs> and I never say a thing, and they come back the next time, and we do it all over again. Uh -huh. I don't say, well, the last time you didn't pick anything up, so we're not playing today. No, because I need them to play. That's for me. You know what? You understand what I'm saying? I get pleasure yes. from this. And I'm a human. And God said, if you find enjoyment in doing things for your children, how much more does your Heavenly Father want to do things for you, yes. give you good gifts? Yes. I understand that part about God. I don't understand the holiness of God. I don't understand all the perfection of God, but I do understand the pleasure of children. Because when my children were that age, I didn't have time to be all that for them. Right. Trying to make a living, trying to deal with all my own garbage and my own mess. See what I'm saying? But now I'm seeing more from the perspective of God, sure. where I can actually enjoy them. Yes. Somebody said the, 
the, the most beautiful sight in the world is the taillights of your grandkids going out the driveway. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know what I'm saying. I can send them home yeah. when we're done. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I just get the positive benefit right. of it. So it's messy, praise the Lord. It's messy because it goes against our grown-up posture, the one that we've been taught to pursue our entire life. Right. Act your age. Grow up. When I was a child, I was curious about everything. I just, I mean, it's just, that's being a kid. Everything is new. Yeah. That's why, you know, we talk, we're always talking to Sally and say, man, this week has flown by. It's like, it's just, it's gone. Well, how come time goes so fast? I said, Sally, get this settled. Same amount of time goes as it always did. Yeah. A 24 hour day is still a 24 hour day, the same as it was when I was 10. It's identical today. What's the difference? The difference is everything was out in front. I was waiting to be 11. Yeah. I was waiting to go to the first show or to do this or to do that. So anticipation puts, makes things seem longer. But the longer you live and the more you do, the less there is that you really care about doing that you haven't already done. So time goes faster because you're not really looking forward to the next birthday. You know, there's nothing, I don't get anything at being 71. I don't get a license, I don't get a drink, I don't get to buy dope, I don't get to do anything when I'm 71. Except what I'm already legal to do. So it's not a big deal. It's not large on my horizon. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's going to be a day that i got to deal with. Praise the Lord. So you, you understand what I'm saying? When you're a kid, you're in awe of every, every and you're waiting, always waiting. You know, it's like, December comes, and how many days till Christmas? And oh my God, that's the longest 25 days in a, in a kid's life. It's like a year, because you just, you can't wait, you know? So I was curious about things when I was a kid, just like grandkids are today. Always after the next bug, the next, the kids went through something this summer with birds. They were just building nests and putting them in the ground because they couldn't reach the nests in the trees, and it's just weird stuff, you know, <laughs> and, and insects and everything, you know. And I'd say, God, those are filthy. That? That's filthy? I don't think so. <laughs> Doesn't seem filthy. It's a bug, for crying out loud. But when I was a kid, I can remember. I remember a particular time, and for, for whatever reason, I don't know. But I remember two, two, two occasions. One was... Uh, I, used to, I had an old bicycle. It was a used bicycle. It was my first bicycle. And it uh, didn't have fenders on it or anything, but it was, it was a bicycle. And it had a split. The seat were, were metal, you know, and then they had this little plastic thing over the top of it. And, it, and you know, I couldn't, couldn't stop it to get off of it because I wasn't tall enough, so I had to just jump off of it. I'd, you know, get it to slow down, and as it was slowing down, then I'd jump off because if I stopped, then it would fall on me and I couldn't get out money. So that's what I would do. So I'm going uptown, and uh, at that time, Bondurant only had like three streets. And you get past the third street, which was a county road, you were in the country. So I'd drive down there, and the, and the ditches were, you know, that high with grass. And those, we, we used to call it Indian gum, and it was just a hollow reed with, full of like, foam stuff. And I remember, because there were six kids in the family, and... Uh, you had to be inventive to get privacy. Because it just wasn't any place in the house you could go and have any kind of privacy. You had to get out of the house. And then you had to really go quick because somebody would always be following you. Older, younger, sibling, somebody. So I'd get on my bike and I'd, I'd ride uptown and I'd cross that county road and I'd be in the, basically in the country and I'd just drive the bike down into the ditch and just fall into the weeds. Yeah. Well, nobody could see you driving by because the weeds are this high. Yeah. So you can lay in there and look up at the sky, look at the star or the moon or the, the sun and the and the clouds and it was cool. Yeah. Not to mention little caterpillars crawling on the thing or butterflies and all those things were fascinating. Now I wasn't wanting to be a 
you know, a scientist or anything. I was just fascinated by everything because everything was new. Everything was different. Everything was the first time, kind of, right? So I'd look at the birds. I'd look at the clouds. I'd look at the butterflies. And, and I was awestruck by it all. It was just amazing, you know? And uh, as I got older, and then actually it seems like the older I got, the more my sense of awe began to diminish. Because I've seen it before. Uh -huh. Seen that hundreds of times, thousands of times, uh -huh. right? And so I became less focused on being awestruck and more focused on becoming awe-inspiring. Because yeah. that's what happens when you get to be a teenager and uh, now you've got to impress, right? Uh -huh. When you were impressed by it all, now all of a sudden it becomes about you instead of about it, uh -huh. right? I want to be in awe again. I want to be in awe of God's creation. This is what I think about. This is what I talk to the Lord about. In awe of experiencing God. I want to be in awe of all that He is mm -hmm. and everything that He does. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to be a student. I want to be a child. Yes. Yes. I'm a different kind of child. An otherworldly kind of child yes. and as God's children we never outgrow him no. God is king of kings and the Lord of lords the only true God all powerful all knowing over all things I'll never get taller than God no. Jared <laughs> Jared got taller than me there was a time he was this little guy with a bow tie. He's just a kid, just a little kid. I don't know that he was ever awed by me, but I'm sure he wondered, what's it like to be a big guy? He outgrew me. I'll never match the strength, the love, the power, the grace, or the wisdom of God. He'll always be yes. daddy. Yes. Amen. He'll always be the one that shows up with the crayons and the bubble gum. Mm -hmm. Has your favorite kind of ice cream even when your mom has told you you're not supposed to be eating ice cream. Or gives you the Coke when you're supposed to be drinking orange Fanta. Mm -hmm. Right, because the Coke will hype you up. That's what I do. I hype them up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> See, the truth is, what Jesus is trying to tell us is, to follow Christ is about accepting this childlike relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. People say, well, how, how do you spend time with God? I've had people tell me, that. I'm, not, I'm not against it. I'm not saying don't do it. Well, I, I, we go away for a week and all we, we just pray. Oh, we go and fast and pray. and I'm not putting that down. I, I mean, if that's what the Lord leads you to do, then by all means. But just let me give you an example. If I want to spend time with God, sometimes I do it at a uh, coffee shop. I'm in the room, and there's maybe 10, 15 other people, but it's just me and the Lord. I'm not there to make friends with everybody. I'm not trying to get a date. Right? I'm, not, I'm just there to have a cup of coffee and be with the Lord. Sometimes, just go for a walk. I'm not really looking for scenery. I'm not looking for flowers. I'm not looking for... I'm just with the Lord. Just walking with God. I'm conscious. I'm aware of His presence. You know what I'm saying? I'm not necessarily feeling anything. I'm just... Focusing on my father and I without having a walk. And I can see what he's trying to show me and hear what he's trying to say to me. Eating at a favorite restaurant. Just think it's the Lord. Yeah. Sometimes I have to take the salad. <laughs> Sally. 
I'm with him, she's with me. Praise the Lord. How about taking a nap? Grandkids used to take naps with them all the time. I'd have to take a nap with them. Uh -huh. I didn't mind at all, to be honest with you. But you can take a nap with the Lord. Just talking to him. Praise the Lord. Maybe pray in tongues for a little bit. Talk about whatever is going on in your mind, whatever's on your heart, you know. And then just take a little nap. Wake up, he's still right there. Yes. Never went anywhere. See, everybody needs to find time with Dad. Yeah. Everybody needs to take time to be with Popo. Everybody needs to take time to let God know, I like being with you. Yes. I, I'm glad you like being with me. Makes life special. Yes. Just like all children, every one of us is unique to God. Uh -huh. You know, the kids are... Sibling rivalry, you know how it goes with little kids. It's never been an issue. You know, you have ones that respond in different ways, and so you can have different, a different relationship in that sense, but you love them exactly the same. If one is more responsive, you just wish the others were more responsive. It isn't that you love the one more than the others. It just makes it easier to, you know, interact. I want to live in this childlike relationship with my father on a regular basis. Amen. I want to be that all the way. I don't want it to just be once every week or so I can come and spend the night with you. Yeah. I want it to be every day. I want it to be that way all the time. Just acknowledge that he's here, uh -huh. that he's with me, that he wants to bless me. He wants me to enjoy life. See, so many Christians are trying so hard to be grown up that it hinders their ability to advance the kingdom of God. Uh -huh. To represent God in the way that He has told us He wants to be represented. We'd like Him to be the big spook in the sky. Ooh, it's so weird what God does. Yeah. And God said, no. Nope. I'd like you to just be as a little child who believes anything I say uh -huh. and expects that whatever I say, I'll do. Yes. If you say we're going for ice cream, yep. we're going for ice cream. And I'll tell you, Sally will tell you the truth too with the kids. I never make a promise that I don't keep. If I tell them I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Right? Yes. I just, I don't say you can come over and then, you know, two days before say, hey, you can't come over. Something else come up more important. When there are times when I'd like to say something more important came up because I don't really feel like getting worn out. Amen? Yeah. But you understand what I'm saying? Because to me, it's important in that relationship that they understand that if I say something, it's given. It's a done deal. And that's the way God is with us. He wants us to be like little children. When God says something... Write it down. It's going to happen. You're going to get it. It's going to take place. If you come with that expectation, with that childlike faith yes. that believes whatever He says, it's done. Yes. It's as good as finished. I may still have the pain. may not have the check in the mail yet. But I know that Popo's going to take care of it because he said he would. Yes. I don't have to worry about it. I can relax uh -huh. and be like a little child Amen. without a care in the world. Amen. Because my father's going to take care of it. Amen. He has promised that if I'll believe him just like a little child, he'll treat me that way. Yes. That I have needs that he wants to meet. Yes. That I have desires that only he can satisfy. Yes. Praise the Lord. Our attempts to control everything limit our ability to make Christ known. Because it ends up being about us. And then people can say, well, yeah, but that's because you went to college or you had this job or you had, you know, a better childhood or you had this thing or you had... No. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with Him Amen. and me believing Him. Yep. Praise the Lord. Our citizenship is connected to being children.
to being childlike. Amen. Jesus showed us we're not just part of some eternal kingdom. We are part of an eternal family. Mm-hmm. Sharing the same loving Father. Experiencing Him in every way. And all that He promises. With childlike faith. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. About done. Praise the Lord. We'll be out of here before noon. Praise the Lord. Hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Through us. Here we are 2,000 years later and the church is still carrying the same baggage of old covenant laws and rules and regulations and hasn't fully come into the revelation. Jesus is presently reigning on planet earth. And we have to press into that reality. We have to live into that reality. He reigns in us. In the ages to come, it says, He'll make known by us the manifold wisdom of God. Mm-hmm. That word church there is ex exousia, uh, and it's uh, called out ones. Called out of what? Out of darkness into His marvelous light. Into the first fruits and from the first fruits. It's more than theology. It's relationship. Praise the Lord. Last scriptures, we'll wrap this up. Psalms 139, 8 through 18. Psalms 139, verses 8 through 18. Praise God. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me, in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in the book all my members were written, which in. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Praise the Lord. It's about us as God's children. Living into our identity in Christ. Greater works, he said, than these shall you do. Because I go to my Father. And your Father. Ask anything. And you could literally translate it, ask anything in me. Mm-hmm. He says in my name, but it's, he says, ask anything in me and I'll do it. Yeah. So that the Father will be glorified in you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Believing as children truly does make all things possible. Mm-hmm. Amen. If thou canst believe as a child, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. The problem is we try to believe as adults. Mm -hmm. And we got way more information than we do revelation. And it gets in the way Mm -hmm. of the truth. Of who he is and what he wants us to experience. Praise the Lord. I don't know about any of the rest of y'all, but I'm going to Popo's for dinner. (laughs) Praise God. He loves you. He gave himself for you. Yes. And no matter 
what the devil tries to tell you, what other people try to tell you, what you even say to yourself. Believe what he says. Yes. You are his precious child. Yes. And he loves you more than you can ever imagine, than you'll ever be able to express. But the sooner you begin to embrace it, the sooner the kingdom yes. begins to be revealed in you and through you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for your patience. Drive careful and look out for the other guy because he's probably not looking out for you. Praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.